on the record, and uh, we're going to get try to get through as much as we can. S-234 may get held up today because uh, a lot of uh, several people have asked to testify on life without parole, but I'm going to start off with Brim to go through the latest draft, and then Skyler, and then um, we have, um, I don't know if Chris Fenno from the Center for Crime uh, Services is going to be here. I don't think she can make it. And Virginia, if you have any other witnesses, um, we'll try to hear from them, and then we have um, some folks from the St. Johnsbury area who want to testify. So. <clears throat> so, good morning, committee. For the record, Rain here from Legislative Council. Um, I have a new draft 2.1 of the bill to talk to you about. There's really only a couple of changes to this draft, um, so I'll just go through those. <clears throat> so, the first change is in section one. Um, I added a new um, sort of phrase at the beginning there of subsection A, except as provided in subsection G of this section. So that language is intended to make it clear that this new penalty section applies for um, to any murders that were committed after that 2006 um, amendment to the statute for any, anyone who hadn't been charged after that. So we talked about that. That's some clarification there. And the next change is in section two. Uh, this is the consecutive sentences statute. This is sort of that, um, that section that is meant to deal with any um, sentences that are imposed back to back. So it's sort of a default life without parole. And I think there was a suggestion from the Department of State's attorneys and sheriffs to change this language so that um, it's clear that uh, anyone who is 25 or younger when they commit crimes um, rather than say that a court can't impose any consecutive sentences, it says that any aggregate minimum of a sentence imposed on a person who is under 25 shall not exceed 35 years. Okay. And that sort of makes it consistent with the new um, upper limit penalty for first degree murder. So those are the only changes to this draft. Okay. Um, I would just reiterate that. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Um, just wondering about aggravated murder there on page five. Where is it? Uh, the last line on page five. Oh. So is the thrust of the bill now that aggravated murder remains a way to have that? Yes, murder? yes, and I should have mentioned that um, the other change that I made was to rename the act um, to limiting the sentence of life without parole because it would prohibit a uh, court from imposing a life without parole sentence unless it's for um, somebody con convicted of aggravated murder. Because uh, that's been one of my concerns throughout is that we're, we're moving toward life without parole, but we're leaving life without parole um, on the table. So all you have to do in order to get life without parole is um, use aggravated murder as opposed to, um, uh, well, like take aggravated murder of a firefighter. So we created that crime, and the only change it made was that it produced a life without parole situation. Before that, it was just the murder of a firefighter, and that would have been, under this draft, that would not have been a life without parole. So it, it seems a small bit schizophrenic for the committee to be preserving that last line there, which keeps a class of life without parole. Does that make sense? Uh, it makes sense to you, but, but I, my feeling is that after listening to the testimony last week, that um, particularly from the victims, um, that it would be hard for me personally to vote for a bill that didn't have something in it. Um, and I, uh, so, you know, we can change that and take it out if the majority of the committee wants after we hear the testimony. 
but it was my judgment that it's still pretty, I mean, kill a firefighter in the performance of their duty purposely, and you prove all the intents of aggravated murder, it's still a pretty high bar. And I don't know how many people actually have been convicted of aggravated murder versus other forms of murder. Um, it'll still be something for the state's attorney to deal with. Um, and it, if you have a truly horrific, all murder is horrific, obviously, but if you have certain elements of aggravated murder, at least you have on the books a way for the public to mm -hmm. deal with it. Um, and frankly, um, it's been brought home to me by what's happened this past week with Wheelock, who murdered somebody mm -hmm. who I knew personally, who um, received at first a 17 to life sentence or 17 to 99 years, and then got 21 to 99. Repeated failure on furlough. Um, and it just seemed to me that, you know, I don't think it was aggravated murder in his case. They couldn't approve that, but, um, you know, that's, that brought home to me if it had been, if he'd killed both James Brilliant and his brother Patrick who were there, you know, that had been a double murder. Who knows what the prosecutor is. So that's, that's where I'm coming from. I asked Bryn to draft that just in that way, away from the witnesses. I, Thank you. <clears throat> I think Senator Benninger also expressed a concern about about not having something still. But I won't speak for her. That's my feeling. I think they said there were 16 people. 16 or 15, yeah. Something like that. And they yeah, but I don't, hmm? I don't know how many of them were aggravated. I don't know how many of them were aggravated. Right, they weren't. So some of them some may of have been... Uh, just regular yeah, murders. It's hard to say that. Regular murders. You don't want to be looking right. at any murders or really Right. Right. Um, you know, but we heard from victims last week, compelling testimony. On both sides, by the way. Mm -hmm. You know, the guy from California whose son was murdered by a 14 year old who's, you know, changed the laws in California. Um, so, and then we heard from Mr. Sobel. So it would, it would be interesting to hear how <clears throat> difficult it is to, to charge and prove aggravated. Murder. We looked, that, Bryn gave us, I thought she gave us Well, we have the list, but I, I mean, from the, pra not from the list of things that are in there, I but see. from the practical point of view of the state's attorneys, of how mm -hmm. how hard is it to to reach that bar? Yeah. I, I don't know. Someone shoots a firefighter off a ladder? Isn't that, that comes under that, right? Um, well, they they would have. Um, it might be better to hear from witnesses and their thoughts on this proposal and, uh, and then move forward and then make our decisions which we mark up the bill rather than. Uh, so, thank you, Brent. Um, gonna, Skyler, do you want to sure. jump up? Yeah. Um, also, can you meet with Senator Camp and I at 10? Yeah. TJ just talked to me about that the other day. Okay, yeah, just the uh, <coughs> college is getting on him about it, so. We don't want that? Yeah, we don't want him getting in trouble. We're, Skyler's helping me and okay. the college with doing a diversity discussion with TJ Donovan, Skyler. Um, and this is going to be. Zunia. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
we're trying to make plans for that. And why is Brian Campion getting in trouble over it? Because he's, work, he's the head of... Uh, he's he works the point of contact. Of he oh. works at the college. Oh, I see. Yeah. He's, his, uh, he's the unseen. He's the CEO <laughs> of, uh, of the Center for Advancement of Public Engagement or something. Oh, is that right? Public action. Maybe? Public action. Mm -hmm. Kappa. Kappa. All right, so we're here on... I know here, Bennington um, College better than you do. Pardon me? <laughs> I know Bennington College better than you do. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, with that... <laughs> you have to excuse my voice is a little weak. Right now I was uh, battling the flu last week. Okay. But I'm good, no, I'm good now. Okay. The voice just okay. remains. Trust me, I would not have put the State House at risk by bringing in the plague. Thank I you. was still under siege. Uh, but for the record, Skylar Nash, student activist, um, it's probably the best title I can think of um, at the University of Vermont. Um, I've been working on um, variations of this bill now to eliminate the issue of life without parole uh, alongside Tom Dalton from Vermonters for Criminal Justice Reform and our national partner Susan Lawrence uh, for just over a year now. Um, and I got to tell you that, uh, you know, this was not at the top of my list when I was looking at criminal justice reform and pressing issues. I don't think it was for um, many people, uh, uh, you know, a particularly hot button issue that we were thinking about day in and day out. Uh, but over the past year, as I've started to dive into the issue, it has really um, risen to the top of that list for me. Um, not just here in Vermont, but I think nationwide. And. It's been a very uh, interesting process because it's a, we're dealing with the worst of the worst in terms of these crimes. Um, but what it comes down to me is, is our criminal justice system going to be acting in the interest of justice or what makes us feel better? Uh, and I think that Vermont has an opportunity to be on the forefront of a change that I think is going to become more common practice over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And then I hope when that time does come that we can look back and say that we were able to have the political courage or uh, you know, other courage necessary to do what I think that the data tells us and most experts tells us is best practice um, in terms of not just public safety but also justice. Uh, you know, I don't have, I'm not going to go through the numbers um, and, and the studies that uh, Susan Lawrence has gone through because I don't know them as well as she does. Um, and you guys have heard them multiple times by now. Um, I w what I will say, is, is what has been a sticking point for me is that I know um, many times over the past hundred years uh, there have been crossroads in terms of us redefining what justice looks like and what justice is and what's in the best practice and, and interest of justice. And I think those have been hard changes to make because they don't always feel like justice or feel like the safest decisions for us to do. Uh, and they can be scary because these crimes are scary. Um, but that's when we need to put forth that courage to do what is really at best practice in terms of pursuing justice, uh, not just for victims, not just for offenders, but for society as a whole. And I really truly do believe that the elimination of life without parole, uh, wholly, not even, not with a uh, cutout for aggravated murder, it is really best practice in pursuit of justice. Um, you know, I don't have much more to say other than that uh, a big thing for me through this entire uh, period and I've evolved on this a lot of different ways during my time for the past year is that uh, it has never quite made sense to me once I started looking at this issue why it is so easy for us to trust the criminal justice system to tell us on a day of sentencing that this is a person that will never be able to return to society safely and we accept that mm -hmm. but then on the back end it is so scary for us to trust that same system if it tells us that this person may have an opportunity to come back to society and be safe. To me, we can't have it both ways. If we're going to trust that system to lock people up and throw away the key, then if that system were to come back to us and say, this is somebody that can return to society and be a contributing member of society and, and safe to return, 
then us denying that person a chance to make that case or, or have that opportunity is a denial of justice as well, um, which is not always the hardest, which is not always the easiest case to make. But I think that uh, it is the case to make, and, and that's what it really boils down to me: is that if we're going to trust the system, we need to trust it on both ends, and we need to give people the opportunity to make that case. Thank you. Um, I was talking to somebody last night who was on this committee in 1987 who introduced a bill on the death penalty. Is the death penalty that had been ruled that's on the books in Vermont had been ruled unconstitutional by the U.S. Supreme Court. And so this then senator introduced the death penalty in 1987. And what the Judiciary Committee came up with was life without parole. So that, that's really the history of it. Prior to that, there had been on the, I believe it's still on the books, but an unconstitutional law regarding the death penalty in Vermont. I don't know why we don't get rid of it since it's... Well, well, you could do that here if you wanted, I guess. But it's unconstitutional, I guess they never wanted to... I don't know. I don't really know why we never... Repealed it. Um, but that lends myself. That lends itself to my point. I think is that you know, during that I time. I wasn't trying to argue with you. No, I'm not at all. But I think the it's history, just. Yeah. I think the history is interesting. I didn't know about that history until last night when I was talking with the senator. And at that point, we probably looked at life without parole and said, "Great, we found a solution well, to this horrible problem." problem. Right. Yeah. yeah. And we've made, I think we've made those compromises in terms of evolving in the state of justice uh, uh, a lot of times. Um, Nationally, is there information on how the death penalty, uh, the life without parole is used based upon race? Is well, it more often? I mean, as with every aspect of the criminal justice system, there are racial disparities. But as Susan Lawrence has talked about, um, they are extremely high when it comes to life without parole sentencing. Obviously, that's not as big of a problem here in Vermont, just with the people that we have currently serving it. But nationally, uh, both at the federal level and then just if you look at the country as a whole, there are large disparities. Um, and I think that, you know, while we want to focus on Vermont, I have also, during this process, taken a national view of that. I do think that nationally this will eventually become the law of the land, but it's going to take some states to take that first jump, as it has with a lot of other issues. Um, and so at the end of this, when that is the case, which I think it will be, uh, I would like us to be able to say that we were, you know, on the right end of this and we're leading the charge rather than following along with Pennsylvania or whatever state comes first. And your thoughts on this draft? Um, I, I mean, like I said in my testimony. Being an intern to this committee is a difficult <laughs> position. Student intern is, being, is testifying on a particular bill. And if you'd rather not, that's okay. But, um, I feel comfortable in asking you that question. Yeah, you know, um, like I said, I would prefer a bill to come out of this committee that did not have a cutout for aggravated murder because I think that if we're going to say that life without parole sentencing is wrong, we have to say that it's wrong in all cases. Uh, on the, we just have to say that it's wrong and that we are trying to slow a change that we, I think, are saying that we need to make by changing it for first and second degree murder, but we're trying to kind of hedge that change by saying we're going to cut it out for aggravated murder, um, which I understand has to happen sometimes. Uh, but personally, I would think that if we're going to say that it's wrong for first and second degree, that we should also say that it's wrong for aggravated. I just think it's important that I like your um, analysis about the, the trust. If we trust it on one end, we should be able to trust it on the other end. And I think that um, that when people, when a lot of people hear this, they assume that the person is going to be paroled. But it's not necessarily. Right. I mean, there are some people that probably never will be paroled because. Absolutely. Because Charles Manson. 
Yeah, and they're probably. He, no, he came up for parole several times. Yeah. And he was never released. Right. Right. So I think, but I think it's important that people understand that this isn't giving parole. This right. is giving them the right to ask for parole. And, and honestly, yeah, I would think that if we have, you know, the most violent among us in jail, that the people inside jail, whether it be their other inmates or the correctional officers, are going to be better off if that person has the self-delusion that they're going to be able to finally prove their case someday and if because of that they behave a little bit better or you okay. know use some services to try to improve themselves that they may not have beforehand i that's think we're better off for that as well that's an interesting point okay. all right any other questions for scott Skyler, thank you thank you very thank much you. um well, that's your time of course if you'd like to testify, if you want to, both can come up at the same time. Feel free. We just need your name for the record. And uh, um, I'm Meredith Berry. I hope I can do this. Yeah, there's a, some tissues. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so. It's hard when you put on the spot, I guess. Um, my cousin, Melissa Jenkins, um, eight years ago almost, I was murdered here in Vermont. And one of the big persons is on life without parole right now, the other one is not. And if, I, I understand it's retroactive, but if it wasn't, it's not retroactive. No. So she could still get out? No. No. Oh, okay. she could still. Uh, the one who was uh, was sentenced to a period of incarceration, who wasn't sentenced to life. He was. He months. was sentenced to life. He. What was his name? I don't know. Don't, 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 don't glorify it. Mr. Yeah. Crew was sentenced yeah. to life without parole for aggravated murder. The his wife was sentenced. She was life without parole. She was life. She was not. He was not. He actually went to jury, went to trial. So she went to life. And so she, she cannot. Take, she under this bill. She cannot. No. Cannot. No. So but going. He, he could under evidently under the sentence that he was. Mm -hmm. But she just wondered if it was retroactive. No, it is not retroactive. The bill as written now is not retroactive. Yeah. Um, there may be a court suit filed by someone to say that because this bill passed that. Um, it should be retroactive, but I don't know that it would be successful, particularly if we leave aggravated murder in. Mm -hmm. My first, my first uh, instinct is her son. Those people took her away from her two-year-old in front of her. He's now ten, and uh, if they with you? have time every other weekend, um, he. When he's 30, and they could possibly be, he could possibly be up for parole and come out. I don't know whatever age it is. I just can't imagine how it was gonna, it will affect him. I worry for him. I don't think he'll ever be out in my lifetime, but it could possibly in his, I don't know. So I fear for them. And, you know, if you decide to, take away life without parole for a first, second, aggravated, whatever it is. I, I fear for what the family would do if they got out. I fear for my family. I've heard people say, let them out. And then I would lose more family members. Um, it was the most, to me, one of the most horrific things. I've been through lots of deaths when I've had brother-in-law's car accidents. I've had lost people to heart attacks, to cancer. But there's no other death that you lose someone to murder. It just doesn't explain anything. And I don't believe that anybody that goes through it, whether it's first degree, second degree, aggravated, it's murder. You take someone's life. <clears throat> I don't believe that you can be rehabilitated from it. I don't think Ted Bundy ever would be. I think of Elizabeth Smurr, who was kidnapped when she was 14 in Utah, and 
she was one of the two percent that actually lived through it after being raped and kept captive for nine months. And she has actually spoken and said how she has forgiven her abductors. And I think, wow, if Melissa, when she was kidnapped, when she was raped, when she was beaten, if she lived through it, maybe she would be able to forgive them. But she didn't have that opportunity to live through it. Instead, she was left in a with ropes and cement blocks tied to her. And the people that do that should never come out again. My family, my children, never should be I have the opportunity to see them again. I don't know, I'm, I'm not as educated as the people in this room. I don't know how to word it correctly. I think you've done a pretty good job. <laughs> My daughter is here to speak as well, and hopefully she can do it better than me. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, she wants Thank to. You. Are there any questions? No. I, I think you expressed yourself very well. If you feel nervous, <laughs> that you might not have been. My best speeches are always on the way home after I've given them, <laughs> so feel yeah. free. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So my name is Jane Berry, and I'm um, also a Muslim Indian cousin, and she was my godmother as well. And I hope you don't see this as me just trying to play onto your emotions and anything like that. But So it was spoken a lot about how people who committed these horrific crimes um, or should be given the opportunity to rehabilitate. But my question is, is what, rehab what is the quality of the rehabilitation in these programs? We know that US, the U.S. has the highest number of people incarcerated in the world, even though we don't have the highest population. The rate of reoffense is high, so who's to say that the quality of the reincarceration re systems is good enough for these people to be let out? Who's to say, who's to say that the quality that they're receiving provides them with the necessary means to be a functioning member of society. Who's to say that? And also, if they are given the opportunity to rehabilitate, the people that they did this to are not given the opportunity to rehabilitate. Melissa Jenkins isn't given a second chance. She isn't given the chance to change where these people would be. If I, I obviously am aware that this, they would not be getting it. the same um, like, I know that these people would not be let out. This, this bill doesn't apply to them. This, this is something that will, will, is me, is, will happen again. Whether we'd like to say it or not, it will happen again. And the same situation should happen. If this bill is passed where someone can be given the opportunity to rehabilitate, the opportunity to change, but the person that they did it to does not get the opportunity to change because they took their life. And to me, that is just doesn't seem fair. And we also talk about how the elements of aggravated murder is they took more than one life. Where, yes, in this situation that I'm emotionally like, attached to, they did take one life. They took one life, but they impacted hundreds. If it was, if most of the kids was still here, her son would have a mother. Her family members would be would still have her. Hundreds of students at St. J. Academy would have the ability to be taught by such a wonderful teacher. And though this is just one case, I, I feel as if something like this will is is bound to happen again. If this happens again, and someone is given the opportunity to rehabilitate, if you will, then. I feel as if it is unfair to the person that they did to, to the family members involved, and to the community, and literally everyone else involved who would have to be out there knowing that these people committed such a horrific, horrific act and were able to rehabilitate themselves and become a functioning member of society. And the argument also is that um, in all cases, so I think because we're making this for first and second degree um, murders that life, the life without parole would be taken away. It says if it's gonna be for some cases, it should be for all cases. I believe that this, this type of crime is so different than other crimes, where it sh I think that there should be different 
yes, there should be, and it shouldn't be for all cases, because there's different scenarios for each case. So why would we make it for all cases if each crime is on a different level anyway? To me, it just doesn't make sense morally or at all. Thank, Thank you, you very much. I know how difficult it was for both of you to come here and talk about it. Um, when I talked to the brother of Jim Jan, um, James Brilliant on Saturday morning, he talked about re being re-victimized every time this guy's went out on furlough. Um, that's pretty powerful. So I understand whenever the, even the possibility of the discussion comes up um, of Mr. Prue being released, I'm sure that will bring back horrid memories. And uh, so I, I don't want to be at all callous, but uh, statistically, um, many people who commit murder are actually um, in looking at their likelihood to reoffend is is relatively low as compared to other criminal activity, but it's such a horrific crime that, um, but it, it, but it is, is truly, um, it's, uh, particularly in um, cases where they're, so anyway, that, that's part of the reason that some people receive their sentence under current law. You know, that many people who might commit a murder don't get life without parole. Um, because Mr. Pru didn't get, for whatever reason, I don't know, I wasn't there. I, I have no idea that the attorneys and, and the state's attorney and how they ended up settling that case and why that happened. But I guess he avoided going to trial. I, he, you know, trial. he went to trial. Virginia, do you have any comments on behalf of the Center for Crime Victim Services? Or uh, if you yeah. don't, that's fine. So. Um, I can, um, I believe that um, Chris Fennell sent in her. Mm -hmm. um, well, she sent in the testimony, but the testimony that yeah. I got in my email was yeah. only the bill. Yeah, she did send And it wasn't this. her testimony, so that's what oh, confused okay. me. Yeah, well, sorry about she that. She may have I didn't, something I didn't in. know. She hasn't said anything Because she, she said something about, she sent something last late last night, but. Um, yeah, it turned out to be just the bill. Yeah. As introduced. Oh, late last night it was due. Okay, well, yeah. so I apologize. I didn't make copies. I can uh, later well, for you. Right. I'll I'll it, or, or I'll just make sure I get it to Peggy later. So, um, Virginia Renfrew um, for the Center for Crime Victims. And the Vermont Center for Crime Victims opposes S-261. Our main concern centers on the possibility of parole hearings for the most serious crimes where victims of families would potentially be re-traumatized. It's important to provide judges with the discretion to set a life parole for crimes that warrant such a sentence. This discretion is relevant as well to cases where plea agreements reduce charges when a person may have murdered multiple people. We encourage this committee to consider not removing the sentence of life without parole at this time. Thank you for your consideration. Uh, yeah, uh, we the letter that you're thinking of was this one from the center, the network, I guess. The network. Network. So, yeah. Yes, the, the network center. Yeah. The uh, network letter we've got, but we didn't get Chris's letter. Okay. I just had it. I'll make copies. You just got it. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else who wants to testify on this before we? Excuse me. Yes. Can I speak briefly? Sure. Uh, you need to state your name for the record mm -hmm. and why. Susan Carr. And I'm a retired victim advocate, but still an advocate, I guess. Um, I worked closely with Meredith and her family in the Melissa Jenkins case. And I just want to briefly say it is so traumatic um, for the families to go through the murder, the trial, and all of that, to have to think that someday there may be a possibility for the offender to get out is just overwhelming. And it would be this burden that they carry with them you know, constantly until that issue comes up or, or doesn't come up. And to say that they have an opportunity to address the parole board is assuming that 
all the pieces are perfectly in place for notification. And having worked in the system for a long time, there's lots of places for problems with notification in the system to victims, especially when a case is 25, 35, 40 years old. Um, so to assume that the victims will have a say when the parole hearing comes up um, may not be accurate. So um, personally. You, no, maybe, it may be for a different bill, but how, how can we improve that system actually? I don't know if you were here when I talked about Saturday morning's conversation with the brother of a person who got murdered who has been repeatedly out on furlough. He's never made parole because the parole board's denied it. He's, he was serving a 21 to 99 year sentence. And so he was out on furlough last week in, in Bellows Falls. And the brother said, well, I never got notified, but his ex-wife, the, the ex-wife of the victim was notified. Somehow he got left out of the notification. Um, so, you know, that, and this individual had made threats against him, so he was concerned that he was out. Um, I don't know, how do you, how would you, as a victim's advocate, if you, if you have any suggestions, um, we'd be happy to hear how we could improve that system. Um, you know, I think that now this person will get um, notice, but um, maybe, I don't know if you know Senator Benning. I certainly represents do. Caledonia County. Yes. Um, you know, any suggestions you have to improve that system of victim notification, be happy to hear about it. Because um, it did fall fall down, I guess, when, uh, this weekend. Or last, it was last week. But. Um, unfortunately, um, that's a conversation for another day because it's no, a really, I know. That's what it's I'm a really offering. big. I'm offering the <laughs> opportunity to have that. I, I would be glad to be part of that conversation. Okay. But systems change within corrections from one system to another system. Something doesn't get moved into the new system, um, and sometimes people don't look at a case and say, "This was a sexual assault. This is a murder." There's probably somebody who cares about it. If the box wasn't checked, they don't look. Um, well, again, I'm offering. Uh, and I'm more than willing to be part of any discussion about that. I just wanted to. Senator Benning. Just so you know, I didn't know that you guys were going to be here to testify this morning. I did hear from James that you were going to be here. Susan, I got your email right after I got James's, which was about 6.15 this morning. Every Thursday, I'm wrapped up in another committee that starts at 8 o'clock, which is why I couldn't be here this morning. I humbly apologize for not being here for your testimony. I would have made arrangements to be here with the other committee chair if I didn't know you were actually going to testify. Sorry about that. Well, I was late getting here, Meredith, and Jay. I didn't know I was coming until last night either, so. It was last minute. Yeah. It wasn't, uh, wasn't on the schedule. I wasn't on no. the schedule. It wasn't on the schedule. I but I would be glad to be a resource no. whenever. Right. Well, thank you. Thank and Jonas had to get hold of me. Thank you, sir. And you know how to get hold of me. I certainly do. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyone else would like to testify on this bill before we, okay. Um, I, uh, any thoughts on this draft? The draft, Joe, has aggravated, the major changes that aggravated murder <coughs> would still be allowed to have a sentence of life without parole. Yeah, so, Senator. So <clears throat> I'll just repeat for Joe's benefit what I said before. Um, I I think 35 years is uh, is a long, long time, and at the end of that time, to say that there's the possibility of parole to me is nothing like a guarantee of parole. So. I, I respect the testimony that we heard, and I, I know it was difficult to give. Um, but the original name of the of the bill was an act related to eliminating life without parole. This draft really makes it more like reducing the use of life without parole, and I think that's useful, and I can I can vote for that. But I I feel that 
again, what we're doing is preserving the concept of life without parole, and it's just we're, we're sort of agreeing to use it a little less. Um, so uh, I suppose one possibility is that we could straw vote on, on the aggravated murder piece. Uh, and as I say, I can support the bill because I think it's, it's better than what we have even in this version, but what we were shooting for originally I thought was better still. Um, there are two things, page five, line 11, which um, aggregate minimum not to exceed 35 years, that you know, we can debate whether it should be 25, 30, whatever. The idea behind that was that when other states have looked at life without parole, They've left that alone. And so if somebody, a bank robbery, <clears throat> then you have a murder of a teller, then you have an escape from, you know, you're attempting to elude, and you get all three of those crimes, and you get them to run consecutively, you could effectively bypass life without parole. And that was why we, you know, you could do 25 years, you 35 years, but it was that idea of that consecutive sentence. And um, when I when I first when Skyler first proposed this bill to me, the first thing that Michelle Child said before she turned it over to Bryn was, "Well, you know, you have to get around that problem." And so that's what this does. So you, we can debate the number. We could also do, and then, you know, the, the reason for the aggravated murder I, I gave earlier, and I, I don't know if I mentioned it to go, but I just think it leaves, it leaves the state's attorney with the ability, and particularly her, you know, in certain uh, crimes, the ability to ask for life without parole. When I first talked with my state's attorney about the bill, she, I thought she said, we've never used it, so I'm fine with it. And then later on, I discovered that she wasn't fine with it, and that other state's attorneys weren't as well. And I, so this is an attempt to meet somewhere in the middle. So if, if people want to express their either for or against the aggravated murder, staying in as the opportunity to have life without parole, I vote yes. Voting yes to, to keeping murder. aggravated murder as the ability. If someone is convicted of aggravated murder, they could receive a sentence of life without parole, which is what this draft has. So you're keeping that in? I'm supporting. Yes. Phil would like a straw poll, so I'm asking. I'm I'm giving my vote to keep that in. Uh, I'm getting confused now, though, as to what the the question is. Are my question to you is: Are you agreeing to give life without parole? On everything except aggravated murder. No, so, no. <clears throat> you're sorry. giving life without this parole for aggravated murder. You're yeah. giving life without parole for aggravated murder. To keep this in the bill. Let me, let me uh, put it, I guess I've confused the situation. Page five. Yeah. Five. Yeah. Line. Yeah. Um, no, it's actually. Eleven. Eleven. Mm -hmm. is no, it isn't. No, it's line 19 where, on page five. Line 19 on page five. That's section three. It would be a new oh, life without. A new section three. Do we have? Do we want to include section three, which, also, which would keep the crime of aggravated murder, where a, a sentence could be life without parole for aggravated for, for aggravated murder. So what? I, what I would like to hear is how, what is the bar for getting to aggravated murder? Well, I mean, I know that, that. I, that no, I, I know that we got the list, but what I would like to hear is in reality, how, how high, how hard is it to meet that bar? Pepper. And if it's relatively easy, will people, will uh, state's attorneys file aggravated Murder a lot more if this so that that's what I would like to hear. I I know the 
what the statute says, but. You can't predict the behavior of the act. Well, we know that, don't we, but. <laughs> so, James Pepper Department, State Attorneys and Sheriffs, there's eight aggravating factors, mm -hmm. any one of which can enhance first degree murder to aggravated murder. Those factors, any one of them, needs to be found beyond a reasonable doubt. So it's not, oh, this person was a firefighter, so it's aggravated murder. The, per the person, the defendant had to have known that he was a firefighter. We have to prove that element, that he knew that he was a firefighter, that he was, in fact, a firefighter, and that he was performing his duty. All of the three of those elements would have to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt, which is the highest standard that we have uh, the highest burden of proof that we have. So, I mean, take, a, take the case of Melissa Jenkins. One person received aggravated murder, one person received... So, I, I think, I'm looking at the factors, and I think that there was uh, perpetrating or attempting to perpetrate a sexual assault. I don't know if that, I... I okay, you may not. I don't know yeah, the exact. Maybe it's not good to go to a specific case. Right. Then. So, what would you need to prove to get the aggravated murder if it was not a firefighter, corrections officer? Supposing somebody killed two people, well, or, or more. Yeah. Right. I mean, it, each one of these factors has essential elements to it, right. and we have to prove each one of those elements beyond a reasonable doubt. I mean, it's 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 not. It's that simple, but it's not easy. I mean, you know, a jury has to say, I mean, we have to show there was multiple people, that there was a premeditated intent to kill both of these people, and that both people did, in fact, die, and that, you know, the jury needs to find all of those essential elements beyond a reasonable doubt. <clears throat> okay. So, in the Townsend case, I can't remember if she... She killed got, multiple people. She, she, and did she get aggravated? I believe she I did get aggravated. I couldn't remember if she did or not, because her intention was to kill the first one. I don't think her intention was to kill the second one. I mean, I, mean, I know that sounds pretty stupid, but he just happened to come on the scene. Yeah. And in her state of mind, she had killed his father, and so. And so. Yeah, and you know, this. <clears throat> These are murders that, as you've heard, impact yeah. a huge amount, the, the broader community. And, you know, I said in my original testimony that these are the kind of murders that make people not want to go into public service, not want to be a firefighter, or not want to help out a person mm -hmm. that they know, um, mm -hmm. which was the case in, you know, the case we heard about today. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and that's the kind of reason why the aggravated murder probably deserves a certain special distinction. And, you know, it's the most horrific crimes that we have. James, did you testify on this already, the amendment? Yes. On the amendment, no. no. Uh, but, I, you know, the state's attorneys have a strong preference for leaving life without parole. In all cases, they certainly have a preference between the original bill and this for, for this, for the amended bill. Um, it, it was our suggestion on the kind of de facto life with that, that the highlighted language that you have in this, so that the aggregate minimum not exceeding 35 years, years. That, was, uh, that came from our department. And that was to avoid what the original bill did, was just said any time that there's multiple charges, multiple convictions, you can't have concurrent, you can't have consecutive sentences. And you know, I laid out a few scenarios, I think, for the committee where that actually discourages sometimes pleading down a felony to a misdemeanor if you have another misdemeanor also. So. Yeah, that was one of the most horrific. I was just looking at Charles Gundler. Um, he, got, he was the one with Bacon. Who got, Gundler was the ringmaster, as far as I, as I recall. <laughs> That was the murder in um, they were on in New Fame. They oh. were on uh, work, work release yeah. or work crew, and they yeah. murdered that couple. And Gundula no, got no, no, they no, didn't. No. They murdered a music they murdered teacher. The teacher from Living the teacher. Right. Oh, the, the teacher. teacher. Right. Okay. You're thinking of the another guy whose name okay. I can't remember. Gundula received seventy-two to life. 
Bacon, who was less involved, got life without parole. Uh, I can't explain it. I mean, I can't. Well, I mean, I I, I, yeah. I'm just saying that sometimes, you know, I, I don't know what that means for this bill, but it isn't always, I mean, obviously, 72 years to life is a long minimum. But, um, you know, each judge <clears throat> goes through the kind of four pillars of sentencing, the purposes of yeah, sentencing. I mean, I suppose, I don't know how old Gundler was. He was probably 20, so it was like, when you're turned 99, you're eligible for parole, I suppose. I mean, it's just, that's how the system dealt with those two cases. And to the best of my knowledge, Gundler's still out of state and not in Mississippi. My memory is Gundler was about 17 in 1982. Yeah, maybe right, John. He was 37 in 2002. He was 37 in 2002. I would have been right then. That former client. Really? No, not a night. I met him. In much, he was in other trouble long before this. Yeah. Well, what brings, it's, a, it's an old case, so it's, it, but it was done under that new law, writing late without parole, but I find it. State's attorneys fashion sentences, no matter what our law is. So can I ask James, I, I haven't been here for all the testimony this morning. I know you've provided some language for this amendment. It's still your preference, however, to leave the law just the way it is. That the state's attorneys, yes. I mean, not, and it's not universal amongst the state's attorneys. Oh, so, is that helpful? Yeah. Okay. So we're still at the straw poll, and I'm the only one that's voted. <laughs> well, I think Philip has voted. Well, yeah. I I would, um, you know, I would prefer to take out section three. I think as a uh, consistency, I would prefer to take it out, but as a as a coming to some kind of middle ground, I would I would support leaving it in. Just although philosophically, I, it doesn't make sense to me. But if those are there are very serious, I guess. I, what, what does that vote mean? <laughs> <laughs> that vote means that I would prefer to take it out, but. Um, if it's necessary to get the bill passed, I would leave it in. That's that's what that vote means. Okay. Alice is calling the question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not willing to take it out. I'm not willing to go to letting somebody off with life without parole. Okay. You're against the bill, no matter what. Well, I'm not absolutely sure. I mean, I think I, I want to look at that list again. Okay. And also, I have to admit, um, you know, horrific murders where there's, you know, it's premeditated, it's a horrible situation that happens. For instance, somebody's tortured to death. Um, I have a pretty hard time with saying that. Well, that, that would be aggravated. Yeah. Yeah. Well, is it right on the list as that? Not to be. Well, do you want time to look over the list? I'd like to look at the list, but I'm. <laughs> Count me as a no at this point. A no well, I'm taking confused. out, I mean, a no on the bill. Okay. All right. I've never really been comfortable with the bill, quite frankly. Um, I see this as an improvement. But I'm still being a no on the bill altogether. So. You are a no on the bill altogether? So. You know, you know, one of my thoughts is um, if somebody has been rehabilitated, which I agree some people have, I mean, you also see people in prison who do fine things in prison in terms of helping their fellow man, mm -hmm. those persons who have been rehabilitated and work within the system. Yeah. I mean, one thing we did check on, the, the person we heard from from California, yeah. Vermont law does not allow a governor to commute a yeah. sentence. The governor can pardon, 
a person like the guy we heard from in California, and I doubt a Vermont governor is going to pardon a murderer unless they want to act like that governor of Kentucky who got thrown out and to pardon a whole bunch of people. But it, so a, a governor in Vermont under the it would have it would take a constitutional change to give the governor of Vermont the opportunity to commute a sentence, mm -hmm. to change any sentence. Something that I'm not sure about, uh, talking with Sarah George, the South State Attorney in Chittenden County, evidently a state's attorney can change a sentence. I, I'm not sure how that happens, but she says she, how can that I don't know how she did it. You but can she can ask for a sentence reconsideration right. within seven right. days of the sentence, but right. not, nothing like what we're talking about here. Right. So I don't think there's any way under current law to to commute by any, but, you know. There, there is a way to get a resentence, right? There's one of those cases going on right now. Isn't there huh? A case going on now where the state's attorney is. Well, it's been brought up as somebody's appeal, and then the state's attorney, maybe it's just in negotiations, agreed to yeah. in a lesser appeal, sentence. They, if the individual appeals, right. I suppose. Well, it was sentence. rather than going yeah. through with the appeal. But anyway, that, I, I'm happy to hold this off till next week if you want to <clears throat> take another look at it and think about it. But it would appear that there's, as of today, there's three votes to approve the bill. And um, if aggravated murder stays in. I wouldn't vote the bill without aggravated murder at this point. So. Then I would vote for leaving it in because um, if that's the way we pass it. Yeah. But thank you for the straw poll. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> So I'm assuming you go for the bill if it has the aggravated. As, as I said, I think even with that in, it's better than the system we have. And, and I, I, the 35 years, we could discuss that. I'm not, that's not a big deal to me. I just you know, think there needs to be. I just want to avoid having the, the court just override it and give somebody such a long sentence that they would never, you know, like somebody got a 400 year sentence to life. <laughs> yeah, at that point it's all about the newspapers. Right. You know. Yeah. Okay. Well, we move on to something else. Thank you all very much. We'll take about a three minute break. Yeah, that's how we put it. Thank you. Eric has an exciting oh, no. amendment. We're on the record. Yes, it Eric is has an exciting amendment to this bill that I'm thrilled about. I'm excited. Yeah. We should all be excited it's about it. It's full of diversions, awareness. <laughs> yeah, all that and more. <laughs> yes, good morning, everybody. Eric Fitzpatrick. Good morning, with, Eric. How are you? Um, I think we're well. Good. <laughs> Good here with the Office of Legislative Counsel to talk about and walk the committee through the uh, new strike call amendment to S-234, which is the Judiciary Miscellaneous Bill. You probably noticed already that it's substantially lengthier than it was the last time you looked ten at pages it. Now. Yep. And uh, well now this version, ten pages long, it should be twenty-six, the one we're looking at. Twenty-six pages. Well, I don't so have that. It's right here. Did she just passed it out. Right on top. Well, I don't well, she just passed it out and laid it on the yeah, top. Mm. Yeah. There might be extras right there, right on the corner, I think. Okay. Thank you. Either she forgot me or I put it somewhere else. <laughs> oh, no. Thank you. Okay, uh, the 26 page version of yes. uh, draft 1.1 1 .1 of S234. Yep. <laughs> I mean, they look at it, but. Mm -hmm. I presume that everything's good. So the, uh, the first, actually, six sections of the bill all do the same thing. You'll notice each section, you'll see the, the change of the word abuse to awareness happens 
uh, throughout the first six sections of the bill. And then what this does, this is a proposal from the Attorney General's office that, and, the, and the Office of Court Diversion Programs. And the issue here is that the program is currently known as the Youth Substance Abuse Safety Program. Uh, evidently, there's some, some young folks who have been reluctant to participate, participate uh, because sort of concerned about the name implies a stigma or that there's a substance abuse issue where there may not be any individual right. cases. Mm -hmm. So the proposal... Well, the Attorney General wants to be politically correct. <laughs> Good response. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> uh, so that takes you right up to page seven. page seven. Yes, thank you. Although actually, yes, on, there is another. Actually, Senator, should I just note the changes? No need to yeah. probably review. Yeah. All right. Yep. So, so that takes us up to page seven. You see, section seven there is uh, um, actually no change to that section anyway. That's the same as it was in the in the original section. Just to clarify, um, possession of minors and possession of all beverages. Uh, the teen alcohol uh, provision is prosecuted under Title VII, the teen alcohol statute, not under this counterfeiting, more serious statute in Title Twenty-Three. But no changes to that. So Section Eight. Um, this was uh, a piece that was requested by the court to address a problem that's going on in the Judicial Bureau. That's based on the way the language is written. You see, line ten, line eighteen. Line four, all the same thing. The, the, using the language admits, does not contest or deny is evidently um, leading some persons to plead no contest, thinking that they're still going to be able to contest the ticket later on, right. not realizing that when you plead no contest, it means it's really an admission. Of, well, it's not an admission of guilt. We aren't able to contest it later on. And so the language is changed to clarify what the uh, what the language is going to be on the ticket so people aren't confused into thinking that they're pleading one thing when they're not. They'll still be able to be clear to them when it is that they're going to be able to appeal. So that's the reason for the language change in section 8. Uh, sections 9 and 10 are... Page uh, 8, 9, 20, you got to type it. Line, sorry? 9, 20. Unless you're limiting it to females. Her or she. Her or she. <laughs> oh, right, thank you. <laughs> right. Yes, I think that it is limited to females. Uh, definitely be constitutional. This is problem. part of our, women this is part of our thrust sort of, yeah. this year. This is about women. They're having a parade on August 22nd. The funding is $20,000. What? <laughs> what are you talking about? The suffragette anniversary, the 100th anniversary parade. You can't call them suffragettes anymore, apparently. You have to call them suffragettes. Oh. Whatever. <laughs> suffragists. Oh, suffragists. Yeah. <laughs> because suffragettes, suffragette is a diminutive. ETT is a diminutive, which means that I'm diminished, right? Uh, well, no, you're just. <laughs> right. What, what page is that on? <laughs> the typo? Yeah. That's on page 8, <laughs> line 20. Nice cat center back, thank you. Yeah. It says her or she. It should say he or she. I think it should say he or she. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Good catch. <laughs> All right. The next change is over on page 11. And this section was actually in the bill in the first place. And that has to do with a request from the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. You may recall there's a concern there's going to be a loss in federal grant money. Right. Because of the way in which the timing is set up for uh, HIV testing, in Wyndham and uh, Franklin County, I think. It, maybe it's just Bennington and Wyndham County. This is very important to the yeah. senator from Wyndham. Important not to lose that. Funding. Well, the, the the funding replaced the but unfortunate reductions by the Center for Crime Victim Services, yes. if you remember. I do remember. Senator, uh, <laughs> Senator Pepper. Uh, James Pepper, <laughs> Department of State Attorneys and Sheriffs. I would just add um, that I have been in touch with the compliance officer at the Department of Justice, and she said that this language brings us into compliance so we wouldn't sacrifice any funds. Good. Okay. Thank you. Great, great idea. Whoever came up with that idea to do that? You changed the language? I think it was Pepper. It's actually me. Oh, it was you. <laughs> oh, my God. Thank you. 
Okay. The only change to that section you'll see is, oh, there's a couple of little changes, but there's some language on line 17 to 18, and the same same language change on line 15 to 16 on page 12. This was to, um, to clarify when it is that um, the court may, or sorry, when the victim may obtain the order for testing. The original language, evidence of guilt is great. Uh, uh, Judge Gerson and Defender General, uh, and I think Pepper as well, all thought that should track Rule 41, which is warrant language in the Rules of Criminal Procedure. So I ran that language by um, everyone, and they thought that um, got the concept better. So everyone signed off on the language here that more closely mimics the standard that's used in the general warrant requirement rule. I'm a little mixed up here. What bill is attached to this? In terms of the original bill versus all of this. Say that again, Turn it. Turn it. I'm trying to figure out where did all of this come from? It's always been in there. That section that was the original bill. Yep. Yeah. It may have been numbered differently because I had to renumber when we added all these new sections. Mm -hmm. But in the but it was in the original bill. Um, with that one highlighted change on line 17, 18, page 11. Yeah. So the section was in there, but that language has been changed a little bit. Uh -huh. Oh, that one. No, I have no problem with it. I'm just wondering when I have it in this one. Yeah, the numbering has changed. So it well, may be a little. The, the bill is introduced, but where we are now. There's a lot more to it where There's we are now. There's a lot more to yeah, it. Yeah, it's a lot heavier, a lot thicker. Yeah. 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 Six pages more. Right. But that, it wasn't from another bill that was put in here. Correct. Not in that case. No. Not in that case. No. I mean, not in that whole case of increasing the size of the bill. Yeah. On to the, the next. Right. There may be one that was imported from another bill, but I'll, I'll mention that when I get to it. But okay. everything else is just uh, reflects yeah. testimony that you've heard. and People were making requests to yeah. add yeah. various yeah. provisions. Yeah. So speaking of sections that are added, that takes us to page 15, uh, section 13. You see, uh, and what I did for any, any section that is newly added, I highlighted, rather than highlighting the whole thing, for the most part, I just highlighted the section introductory language, for example, line one, page 15. That is highlighted because that wasn't in the previous bill. <laughs> and this is, this reflects um, uh, request from the Attorney General's office it has to do with the fact that risk assessments, the way the way the language is phrased right now, risk assessments do have to be offered to a person who is <coughs> unable to post bear within 24 hours of lodging. But uh, according to the testimony, these uh, risk assessments can't be done because the prosecutors don't have access to that sort of information, so they can't be done. They're not being done as a matter of practice either. Uh, they still get to see, they still get the uh, uh, need screening, you see line seven, so the need screening isn't changed. They still get the need screening, um, but the risk assessment language is So the risk assessment language in the title on line two, is that still covered under this section in the sub A or sub C that we don't have in front of us? That's a good question. It may be that that should be struck as well. Um, so let me double check the rest of the statute to see it. Like pig <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> you are. <laughs> Uh, section 14 and 15, both um, these are, were in the court's proposal that uh, to clarify that a person's criminal history records can't be expunged until they paid court surcharges. And this is consistent with other provisions of law that prohibit expungement until uh, various fees or surcharges and uh, restitution have been paid. And this is um, making clear that surcharges have to be paid as well before expungement can happen. And that's the same, that's section 14, section 15 as well. Section 16, uh, this basically is a, an, a permission for the probate court to uh, allow a will to be valid, essentially to be, to be admitted as valid, if there's no objections, when one of the witnesses testifies that the will was properly executed. So if there's no objections, there's a bit of a uh, streamlined process for allowing the will to be admitted. Now that doesn't mean that every provision of the will is going to be valid, and that goes further on. But just to admit it as, as the valid will, you can do it if there's no objection. And this is the new language <coughs> on page 18, lines 1 through 5. I see that? Mm -hmm. Yep. 
line six through seven, although it's moved, that's actually still, in, that's just a repeat of what's in the statute at the top of the page. But the new provision is subdivision one, it allows the will uh, upon the testimony of only one of the witnesses if they testify that um, it was properly executed. As long as there's no Where objection. You do have a typo there too. Oh, really? I thought. Yeah. Uh, line that? four, yeah. executed as provided. Oh, well, thank you. Provided. As you can tell, this has not been through the proofers yet. <laughs> <laughs> it was done late last night. <laughs> but that will obviously happen next, but thank you for catching that. We already talked about the 10,000. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And I finally, after we were sort of trying to understand how that worked, and um, after further exploration, I understand that the, the way it's drafted uh, works well. I mean, the existing section. There's no, no need to make any changes to the way the, the language is set down in the existing uh, provision of Title 14. So it just ups the amount so that um, the Superior Court doesn't have to approve settlements of $2,000, $2,500, $3,000, that their supervisory requirement, their approval requirement doesn't kick in until uh, it's a settlement that's greater than $10,000. We're due to have a break at 10. I don't know what the committee wants to do. Maybe we can go to at least get the walkthrough done yeah. and take testimony after the break. Yeah. Yep. That would be OK. Sounds good. Um, so that brings us to section 20, and the rest of this are going to go pretty quickly, I think, anyway. This is just a change because there's a reference in the, um, in the child support statute to parent-child contact. But parent-child contact is not uh, decided in child support. Child support is how much money has to be paid in terms of support, not, not to do with uh, the actual contact between the parents and children. So that's removed for that reason. It's not relevant there. You'll see that in subdivision 20, sorry, sub, section 21 is in the uh, mental health proceedings, which sometimes take place in the criminal division, sometimes take place in the family division, right? But the statute says criminal division only. That's not accurate, so it's changed to superior court because sometimes it's in one division, sometimes it's in the other. It depends on what stage in the proceedings uh, you're at. Section 22, this actually is new. This was a provision that uh, got added uh, uh, last evening that was meant to be included earlier, but um, there was an oversight. So it's in here now. Uh, I think Judge Gerson will be able to explain a little bit, or, or we'll both explain a little bit. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, my understanding of it is it's a request from the Judicial Bureau. And there is a problem with the, I almost thought of it as a, uh, Coding error, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but uh, I don't know. <laughs> right away. It is something to do with the entry of information in the Judicial Bureau, and they're not able to do it properly uh, with respect to admissions. And somehow, with the statute being changed um, to incorporate admissions, then they will be able to do their data entry properly and have it um, uh, correlate with the payment of fines to the Bureau. Uh, sections 23 and 24, this, Senator Nick, uh, this is the two pieces that did actually come in from another bill. 23 and 24 came in from the corrections, the general corrections bill that we were looking at earlier this session. And this has to do with when the uh, Department of Corrections has to provide separate facilities for youthful offenders. Right? Under current law, you'll see, and this is um, on the top of page 22, under current law, separate facilities have to be provided for offenders under age 25. I see that? Line one and two? Mm -hmm. That's existing law. The proposal is uh, that appropriate facilities would still have to be maintained for people under 25, but the separate facilities, you go down to line five, would only be for folks under age 19. So there's a lowering of that age to when the facility has to actually be separate. Then, and separate mean sight and sound, is that right? I believe so. Oh, uh, that's yeah. an issue that we're going to deal with in another bill um, at some point, because when we talk about the closure of Woodside, that's an issue, because if you close Woodside and you presume that an 18-year-old kid is going to go to a 
17 year old or an 18 year old, we pass this law, will can you close Woodside with a 17 or 18 end up at the four bed in Marble Valley? The, commission, the current interim commissioner of corrections does not want that to happen. He says that no matter what you do, you shouldn't be holding that age group in prison. But if currently there's a 15-year-old at Woodside, so to use that example, you close Woodside, that 15-year-old would require two correctional officers round the clock, which would be probably total four or six of them, to supervise that guy in a motel or that kid in a motel. I don't know if it's a guy or a girl. Um, so you, that's something that we're going to talk about in the Woodside uh, when we talk about the, the bill we had yesterday when we get to whether or not you close Woodside. The juvenile justice bill that we talked about yesterday with um, Ken Schatz. And we're going to continue that conversation, but that is one of the considerations. You know, I'm, I'm fine with this in here, but um, if in fact we choose that, we don't want to hold kids in Marvel Valley in those, that four bed unit. Um, and you close Woodside, you, you have a dilemma. <clears throat> we will hear testimony after. Mm -hmm. But I, I support this change. This, this is consistent with what the raise the age did. Mm -hmm. so. Yes, and as the next Actually, I'm, well, I'm wondering if those two shouldn't be in that other bill, actually. Right. To it's, be consistent. That's the issue is there. Right. Um, I think Brent's doing that bill. On, um, Juvenile Justice Technical Amendments. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we took it up yesterday. Um, <coughs> it's act, actually S232. So that these sections probably belong in S232. Okay. So that we're consistent. Whatever we do would be consistent with that bill. Sounds good. I'll follow up with her. Yeah. I've heard put those sections in but this, 232. But, but this makes perfect sense to me. So then we'll skip to section 24, move over to section 25. Uh, this is a proposal also from the court and from the Probate Judges Association. Evidently, right now, there's <coughs> language that allows for a fee to be charged that actually probate division does not have jurisdiction over those cases. Those cases are in the civil division. So since uh, settlement of these minor cases uh, it doesn't happen in the probate division, it doesn't make sense for that language to be there uh, providing for a probate fee in those cases. So it's struck. In Bennington, I'd probably say since the probate court is not open during business, during working hours, <laughs> for working people, we want to keep those minor cases in another court that's so. <laughs> open. The next section 26, also purely technical, you see in the existing law on page 23, line 19. Uh, there's, a, see that line 19, the very first phrase there, guardian ad litem. So the guardian ad litem is already uh, permitted to inspect files, notwithstanding the general confidentiality provision. But for some reason, the same person is repeated again. Uh, and it's just the next subdivision later, line Two of page 24. They're not, they're not trying to sneak in or name change for the guardians. <laughs> not that I know of. <laughs> we gave up on that. <laughs> Section 27 is the same concept I talked about earlier. Again, this is another provision around expungement and sealing of records, making clear that in this case, sealing of uh, records in juvenile cases uh, doesn't take place until restitution and surcharges are paid. No change to sections 28 or 29. Section 30, this is a repeal of, uh, this is also requested by the court. This is a lengthy chapter in Title 12, subchapter rather, that allows for voluntary arbitration in medical malpractice cases. I remember nobody's ever done it. Since 1975, that only hasn't been used. So. It's a great idea in 75. <laughs> right. <laughs> I can just leave them now. Wow, they probably had long debates. <laughs> 
They were debating how to do it. Is line practice? Line 15 is that supposed to say section 29? Is that line 15 of on page 24? Because there's yeah. section 28 and then there's section 30. Is that supposed? To Actually, no. That's a, that's an interesting. It's a it's a confusing way that. Um, because section 29 of the bill, which starts on line 13, amends oh, section there, three. See, see that? That's why that's indented. I've got it. Yeah. I, I yeah. didn't see that section. It is. It's always visually confusing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, lastly, uh, this is a new provision, section 31, that the committee may recall discussing, but we hadn't had the language in front of you yet. So uh, I worked with David Scher on the language from the Attorney General's office. And again, this estate basically establishes a reinstatement fee holiday program that allows people to uh, uh, get their suspended driver's licenses back <coughs> without paying a fee. That's the general gist of the program. It applies, or sorry, it's in existence for a month. You see line seven to eight. The application period is during September of 2020. Uh, available to anybody who applies for reinstatement during that month. And if you do, if you apply to the Judicial Bureau, this is line 10 for reinstatement during that month, you can have your license reinstated without paying any fees. And these fees that would be waived would include, this is line 14, the DMV reinstatement fee, the Judicial Bureau for failure to answer the complaint, failure to pay fees, and any surcharges imposed by the court. So all these fees are waived, and the only thing that the person would have to pay, you see line 19 of page 25, is a $10 fine. This is this for all suspensions? No. Um, suspensions that are not criminal. That, right. That were not a DUI or right. drive, uh, it, uh, a a Charles is negligent criminal. Right, That's but right. it's for fines. It's for fines and surcharges and the reinstatement fees. Shouldn't that be made clear? It just says permit mm -hmm. whose uh, motor vehicle license has been suspended. I, get, I don't know. Well, when we get back after the break, we can okay. talk about what should be clear. I also okay. want to consider that on October 1st, all licenses have to be real ID in order to get on an airplane. We might want to move the dates to like August 15th to September 15th to give people time to make sure that they're, if they had a license suspended and they want to get on an airplane, they're going to need a real ID to do it, um, which may give some people an incentive to, to do it. So then they might, you know, motor vehicles might need time to just have this system. I don't know, but that's just a consideration. Uh, I saw the ad yesterday. You know, or the TV. ad about huh? the ad about being a real idea for a after October first to fly, in, you have to have a passport or a real ID under mm -hmm. federal law on your license. That means if I want to go visit my daughter, I better get rid of my little green cracker jack box. <laughs> yeah, well, after, I don't. I'm, maybe I'm using the wrong term. Yeah. I want my you have to have a certain license. Is I think it's the real enhanced. ID? Huh? Is it enhanced yes. driver? Maybe it's enhanced. Yeah. I get confused between the two. But, but you can't fly with an enhanced overseas. No. Huh? You have to have a real ID. You have to have a, real. You you have to have a passport. passport. Yeah. You, can't, you can't go to Europe with a real ID. No, we can go to Canada or Mexico. Right. So the question on the last page. Yep. Uh, it says the public education required by the subsection shall include encouraging program applicants to check all DMV records. <coughs> what, do, what do we mean by that? Well, if there's an out-of-state suspension, say you had your license suspended in Vermont, and you also have a suspension from, Ma from Massachusetts or New Hampshire, there's nothing we can do about that. but to, but. At the time you're taking care of your Vermont suspensions, you may want to take care of your New Hampshire or Massachusetts suspensions. So you need to check the record to make sure. But but I mean, this makes it sound like they have the ability themselves to check DMV the records. records. Uh, They're just going to go to the DMV. David will explain that uh, to you. Um, it's as simple as voting. I mean, we, but I mean, I, I don't know. It sounds like the public education campaign 
should encourage them to do something besides going to the DMV and yeah. saying, what do I do? Well, I think the idea is that if somebody were to go to the Judicial Bureau, say, yeah. um, and not the DMV, which is a possibility, that it would want to check DMV records for the purpose that Senator Sears mentioned, and also to make sure that um, every ticket that was assigned to their license was being checked, because sometimes people, uh, names are spelled differently, or people have changed their names. Um, so if you go in with a, and say, hey, such and such name, I want to pay off all my stuff, that might not actually get every ticket that's assigned to you. And DMV apparently was saying, we're discussing this, that is a real issue that comes up. Okay. So they were really wanting to encourage people to check with them, even if they go through a different avenue, to make sure they get every ticket. Right. We're, we're we gonna... need to discuss this. What? We, let's discuss this more. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we'll take a break and then come back for discussion. Yeah. We've done the walkthroughs. I thought that's what we you said originally. We completed the walkthrough. Okay. Yeah. Walkthrough's done. Yeah, I thought but that's what you said we were yeah. going to do. But David will, will testify <laughs> next. Yeah. Please. Please. Grill. <laughs> <laughs> what time are we coming back? 10.30. 10 yeah, 10 yeah. uh, Peter Sterling wants to talk to a couple of you. David, uh, Senator Nitka has a number of questions, but she's not here. So I guess we'll just approve this. Mike has canceled, too. Yeah. 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 Oh, so oh. we're still on 324. Yes, we're still on 234 yeah. until, uh, until uh, 11 a.m. And then at 11 a.m., we're going to switch back to the insanity defense. So, you want to explain your proposed amendment? Sure. So, the, I can say it's hard, but I, I, you know, it's really your, uh, your brainchild. But thank you for the yeah. effort. Um, David Chair of the Attorney General's Office. So um, I think uh, Attorney Fitzpatrick did a good job of giving an overview on it. I mean, the basic concept here is to have a month where people can come in and wipe out their old fines without having to also be burdened by the reinstatement fees that come along with that. And, and those fees come from both the DMV and the Judicial Bureau. Uh, and we're just trying to get as many people licensed as we can. Uh, I think we all agree on the policy behind that and having the roads be safer with licensed and insured drivers. Um, this is a way of doing it. This does result from a meeting we had that included DMV, the judicial judiciary with Judge Gerson was there and uh, Joanne Charbonneau from the Judicial Bureau, Dave Evans from DMV, um, and several other people from, uh, who would be involved administratively in this. Um, a couple of ideas that have actually bubbled up just this morning would be to get rid of the fine altogether, just have an administrative process where we could um, pretty rapidly wipe out, because the fine just isn't, we're not talking about an amount of money that's all that meaningful. Um, you mean the $10? Yeah. yeah. And so there, one idea that just came up, and this hasn't really been vetted through the group yet, but um, it could be that we just have no fine at all. and use an administrative process to wipe out the fines that fall within this category, suspended for non-criminally. Um, there have to be some effort to communicate with people to make sure that they know that that happened, but that, those are issues we can think through. Um, so those are a couple of ideas that have just come up, and we can work on refining this more and, and keep working with that group. Um, just three questions I have. One is, um, how, is, how do we know this is just for civil, I'll call it civil, mm -hmm. that somebody who has their license suspended for DUI is not eligible? I think that's a good point. We should clarify that in the statute, unless uh, I defer to elect counsel if they feel like it's sufficiently defined already, but I, I think it's probably important to make that clear. So we can amend that. I, I Second assume. question is, I know that I'm going to get pushback from my town manager. He's going to say, well, 
you know, you're taking away my fine money from my town that's already down, you know. Is, so somebody who has $800 in fines, surcharges, and interest, <coughs> they're not going to pay it. They've been suspended for a year, clearly. But what about the person who's suspended license comes up on August 31st? And now all of a sudden they can get rid of their fine. Is there a should there be some kind of a oldness to it? Like I don't know how to put it, but you know this the, it has to be more than six months old. Oh, I see what you're saying. I suppose that that could be a safeguard on that. I think that it may be kind of unfair to me, who's going to pay my fine, for somebody next to me to, to just walk in and who got fined two hundred and fifty dollars, including all surcharges, and yeah, right. just get away with it, not have to pay anything because they were lucky enough to get fined during the month of September. I mean, I, I'm speculating a little bit, but it would be somebody would really have to be clever and thread the needle just right to, to they have it. <coughs> all the timelines work out so that they know they're going to be suspended during this month. And then they wait, go under suspension, and then get out from under the ticket. I frankly think it's unlikely that somebody's going to do that, or even know enough about the timelines to be able to game the system that way. Well, but we're advertising. We're advertising. But you would have. But again, the 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 timeline. You know, you have to make sure that it's not like you get the ticket and go under suspension. There's timelines that. Um, Precede. Precede it and come into play. So somebody would have to calculate it correctly. If they miss the month, then now they're out the other side and they're just sitting there with a suspended license and they have to pay everything. Um, and it's not all, it, frankly, they don't, the timelines don't always happen exactly as they're advertised because, uh, you know, there's mail time that happens. And I think it would be, I, I, I see the point and I think it might, that's something we could do. I don't see there being a big risk of scoff laws because I don't think it's actually that easy to for somebody to do that. Um, and I, the group, for simplicity's sake, felt like it was easiest just to say, let's forget about those sort of, you know, system gamers and just say blanket. Um, what about the town manager, the local government, who says we're losing our fine money? I think everybody agreed in that meeting that the, the collection rates are low for this type of stuff. You're not actually talking about losing much money here because you're not, they're not getting the money now. And that, that came from DMV too, and they could testify a little bit more expertly to some of the collection rates, but the reality is with both with the general reality, the people who are under suspension for a while aren't likely to pay, and also apparently with some of the legal changes more recently, it's made the collection rates go even lower. So they're just, you're not talking about a practical loss, you're talking about uh, uh, a non-collection either way. So, so far, Alice, we've talked about how to make it clear that it's not a criminal license suspension for a DUI or careless and negligent driving, which is criminal. The second thing we talked about was whether or not there should be any fine at all currently as it's drafted on line 19. If you had 10 tickets, you'd pay $10 a ticket or $100 um, would be the total fine. And maybe there should be no fine at all. I, think, um, I mean, in terms of just the general public thinking about this, in terms of there's your issue, even though there's not much. I can't hear you right now with that door open. I like the hundred dollars. I mean, people are getting yeah. a tremendous well, gift. Yeah. Assuming they have ten. ten. Yeah. It's I, taking I, some personal responsibility. I like your idea of a delay too. Um, you know, if someone like the more recent person doesn't just jump right in, yeah, and even though that would be rare, the perception of the whole thing. Well, would let's be. get testimony from DMV about whether that could happen. Could I ask a question first about the ten dollars? Does it cost more to um, process the ten dollar fee for everybody than it would be worth? I mean, do we end up collecting about three dollars? I couldn't. I didn't okay. defer to Judicial Bureau okay. on beyond that. I don't know about the cost. Okay. Any other thoughts on this? 
I would, I would like if you would send this out to DMV and any other parties that aren't in attendance today and set up sometime next week for comment on this. And then I want to, after we finished it, I want to run it by the Transportation Committee. All right, thank you. Uh, is there any other comment today? Judge Bruce? Judges that we just talked about to be made, and I would want to clarify that it's for traffic violations, right? Right. Um, you were talking about, Senator Sears, the dates of the, of the period, too. Nope. Do you want to change it to August 15th, September 15th? I think August 15th, in line with, the, with this, if it's necessary. Actually, I'd like to hear from you. Actually, you could ask you to read that question. If somebody, if, if somebody was to pay off their fine, or, you know, get their license reinstated on September 30th, would they be eligible to get a real ID on right. October 1st? How long would it take for this, you know, does it take a week for their process, for example? So that's a DMV question. Yeah, really. I don't know how long it takes for them to work through the system that the person's license is no longer suspended and is now they're okay to go get a new license. So do you want to set up, have them come in next week to, re to yeah. respond? Yeah, well, but I would like them to get it. Mike Smith is probably the person to send a copy to and just okay. get he is. Is it Jake? I love that. Is Jake still there? Yes, yeah, still there. He is. Jake may be want to testify. Okay. Sounds good. Judge? Sure. Uh, just briefly, uh, Brian Grierson, uh, Chief Superior Judge, uh, testifying with respect to S234, draft 1.1. We've seen the draft. Uh, I thank the committee. It looks like all of our requests have been incorporated in this most recent draft, with the exception of the section relating to uh, judicial evaluation. We understand the committee's position with respect to that and we'll decide, I guess, whether we're going to continue to pursue it otherwise. But I, I understand the committee's position and thank you for including everything else in, the, in that draft. Uh, with respect to um, the fee holiday, yeah. I, I've, I've written to folks internally in, in the Office and Judicial Bureau, my immediate reaction to it is, if you're, if you're down to $10, I'm, I'm wondering if it makes more sense to eliminate any payment and just uh, allow the Attorney General's Office to provide the, the uh, court with a list of cases to be dismissed. We make an entry and we're done with it. And, and I mean, the, to the effort to process a $10 payment doesn't seem to make any sense to me, but I don't know internally what it what it would mean to turn this into a dismissal, but we then wouldn't have individual petitions. Attorney General could get the list of cases that are applicable from the DMV. Here's a list of whatever it is, 100 cases. Send it to the court, dismiss it. And then you send a letter to the person saying it's been approved. Or somebody would. I don't even know that. I haven't gone that far ahead. People, okay. but people would still have to do something affirmative in order to take part in this, right? I mean, they have to apply. It wouldn't be like the lines, would it be like the, uh, maybe I'm misunderstanding. They still have to do, take some personal responsibility by at least contacting DMV or? That's what. What, what do we envision here? I know the, when they did it in Chittenden County, there were lines stretching out to the okay. street. That's because, if I understand how that process worked, they declared the whatever it was, amnesty, and came in, and there was a reduction. In other words, there were payments processed that involved the court in uh, approving uh, agreements. Um, and so there was some significant amount of, of work involved in that. And uh, this, all I'm thinking, and I may be wrong, and that's why I'm waiting to hear back from the Judicial Bureau, is that if we're doing all of this work for ten dollars. Maybe we should just dismiss the cases, and then it's on our end. It's a simple entry in the system that they're dismissed. As far as how people get notice of this, I, let's. I'd like to have some time to talk with the judicial bureau and talk with David about this idea. 
see what would be involved. Is there going to be pushback from state's attorneys? Uh, these are not criminal issues. I mean, in, to, to be honest, they become criminal issues if you get a number of tickets in a certain num a certain number of years. And these are the lowest level prosecutions, lowest priority prosecutions that we have. So I don't see why the state's attorneys. I mean, I'll reach out to them with this language, but I don't I don't see a big pushback on this. And, and I know when this was first being discussed before we saw it in this form. Think, uh, someone was putting together a fiscal impact uh, uh, information for the committee. I don't have it with me, and I will find out where that stands. Do so, you know who was doing that? Then? We should invite them to. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Who gets the money from the fund, search areas? Oh, work? oh, it's for these search areas, I think it's like the technology fund is what. Is the, fee, the fees go to the technology fund. The surcharge is the same, right? This, we talked about victims groups and, uh, and, and the technology fund um, is what, in part, is paying for the new case management. In other words, built into the request for case management. If they don't get paid, you don't get the money. Anymore. Right, right. I was going to say that they don't. So that's why very little. They, you would end up with because they're not going to pay the fines anyway. Right. I'm so if we get a, if I have a fiscal impact, yep. I'll make sure the committee has it. Peggy, would you make sure that when you take this up next time, next week, that we ask the victims of the network? Or just I think it's CC, I think it's the center. I, center for Crime Victim yep. Services. Yeah. I know that the local government will probably have pushed back. They're in town today. Right. Well, they're not testifying today. No, but I mean, they're, they're around I know, the building. But we probably should contact the League of Cities in Dallas, too, so they can give their testimonial. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Just, just, just for the mechanics of it, is it, would it, be, is it the bureau that would dismiss these? Yeah. So that maybe it wouldn't need to even involve the AG, right? If people well, buy the AG, AG would, no, and I'm thinking out loud, but I'm talking with David, probably the AG could go to the DMV to find out, get the list of people that these are only civil tickets and not, they're in, not the criminal violations. They would have that list, and they break it down by county where these tickets are, and then send the list to, let's say, Washington County. Here are whatever number of cases, and the state is requesting that they be dismissed. And then we would do a computer entry of dismissed. And Peggy, would you also put that? The I've got to talk with DMV. Okay, so we're to see how it works. But I, I, it may not be as simple as I explained it, but I would like to think it is for this. $10 is we just got not worth somewhere, and I don't right. know where I put it. Processing okay. individual Yeah, that makes sense. I'm just going no, back to a serious point. Well, that well, well, yeah. How can you right now? We know that that we take it that yeah. to go in and apply. I know. How do we do that? That's what I've got to okay. talk with David about. Thank you. Um, now we're going to, uh, this has been an interesting day. To, we've gone from life without parole to license suspension to competency to stand trial. Our first witness on the competency is Jack McCullough, director of the Mental Health Law Project, Vermont Legal Aid. Welcome back, Jack. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm happy to be here. I'm Jack McCullough. I'm an attorney at Vermont Legal Aid, and I'm the director of our Mental Health Law Project. In that uh, role, we represent people in all the civil involuntary mental health proceedings in the state. Um, and uh, what I'm here to talk about mainly is the, uh, is the issue in, uh, in, the, in the bill before you about uh, what's described now as party status for the Department of Mental Health and for the uh, Mental Health Law Project in uh, hospitalization here. 
we agree that it is important for the um, defendants in hospitalization hearings to have uh, representation by uh, an, an office with the expertise and knowledge of the mental health system. And uh, back a few years ago in, uh, in S61, we had a, a proposal that would have created, we, that would have appointed a mental health law project to represent people in these uh, involuntary, uh, in the hospitalization hearings. Uh, what I've passed out is a memo that sets forth essentially a tweak of the language that we have in this 61. And I agree with the people who observed that it doesn't really make sense to talk about either the Department of Mental Health or an attorney as having being a party to the litigation. Because, you know, we're not a party, we're just a lawyer who, who represents uh, uh, people. And so what the change that I propose to section three of this bill is to, uh, as, as you see, that uh, the court, when a person is found incompetent or uh, insane, and we're now at the point of uh, hospitalization hearing, that the mental health law project would be appointed by the court to represent the uh, defendant in the hospitalization hearing, and the Department of Mental Health would also have the opportunity to appear and be rep in that hearing and be represented by the uh, uh, Attorney General's office. And so, what this is designed to do is not to oust the uh, state's attorneys from their role in prosecuting these cases because I understand that uh, they uh, want to maintain the ability to assert their position, but it would also allow, in addition, to have the Department of Mental Health be in there and arguing for, for their preferred uh, outcomes. Um, Could I ask a question? Sir? Are you proposing on, in our bill, there is no five, so you're proposing putting a five? This would be an addition, yeah. And so then would you, on the top of page four, those two lines, would you eliminate them at the same time? I would eliminate those, yes. But and leave the rest of four? I, I, should, I got my file upside down, so I should check okay. and be sure I know what I'm saying. I think you correct that this is, yes, uh, as the uh, believe it, under general was concerned about that mm -hmm. section as well yesterday. Mm -hmm. This would remove that. Uh, I'm assuming remove the term uh, parties to the hearing. Well, mm -hmm. remove all of those two lines, right? And so, add this instead. Right, yeah. lines one and two of page four would go. Yeah, okay. And then and then add this five. Yes. Okay. Got it. What about section one? The commissioner shall be a party when the issues of competency are raised. That's uh, yeah, I would take, 16. I would take that out too. <clears throat> now, you're suggesting in here in the, that legal aid does not the present have the resources to take on this additional caseload. You, uh, being a member of the Appropriations Committee along with Senator Nickter, I'm always concerned when we talk about additional resources will be needed. Um, you have an estimate of what that might be? We've been, I've been talking to Judge Grierson to see if we can find out, estimate how many cases it would be. Uh, the last time we had this uh, proposal, there was a a fiscal note that was uh, that was pretty substantial. It was based on an assumption of about 197 cases a year. I don't know if that's the right number or not, but uh, but the judiciary is uh, querying its uh, database to see how many cases we could expect uh, 
to have to litigate. But based on uh, around 200 cases a year, we're thinking it would probably uh, require us to add uh, two attorneys. About 200,000? I think it was around two, 240, somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, and then the other, the other factor is it would probably involve an additional uh, expense for independent psychiatric exams that are not being done at this point. of making all of you parties to it would also be a resource issue, I assume. Yeah, I think so. So where do we adopt this amendment? And, you know, I think we need a fiscal note to understand yeah. what the, um, it'd be kind of phony to pass this and then <clears throat> not fund it. If you could find the lawyers, I've been talking with mm -hmm. uh, several people who hire lawyers, defender general, state attorneys, they're having a hard time. I don't know if you are we've legal been, aid. We've been successful at hiring great attorneys. Uh, I think probably some of you know uh, Maureen O'Reilly who's been uh, working on expungement. And you know we, we take the job of hiring new attorneys very seriously. And so you know if we don't get a good pool, we will be advertised rather than hire someone who's not going to do the job, but uh, we were pretty successful at getting people to come. Good. Yeah, we, we're very proud of the Great job. So I don't know what else to say at this point. Um, does, how does the committee feel? Well, first I guess we should hear from the AG and the uh, Department of Mental Health on this Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. For the record, uh, Morning Fox, Deputy Commissioner, Department of Mental Health. Uh, thank you for having me today. Uh, in reviewing uh, Mr. McCullough's uh, memo and, and language, uh, I think the department uh, is uh, able to be in support of this, this language. Uh, uh, moving forward uh, in regards to this. The one piece that I'm just, uh, I guess I'm just a little confused and looking for some clarification uh, is that uh, uh, understand about uh, the department uh, being able to, to have that status at hospitalization hearing uh, placement. Uh, one thing we had discussed was uh, the department at least having uh, party status in, in, I forget the actual terminology, but so that we could receive uh, notice uh, upon uh, competency or sanity uh, uh, findings or, or issues coming up prior to an actual hospitalization hearing, just so that the department is aware uh, that those things are going on uh, to, to ensure that we have that notice. Uh, I just didn't want to lose sight of that piece. Uh, but otherwise, the language uh, here that uh, Mr. McCullough has put forward is, is acceptable uh, for the department. Did you anticipate spending more money? When you proposed having, was it you that proposed having party status with the yeah, with the legal aid? Uh, yes, um, it's. We think that we. It's our hope to be able to absorb that uh, okay. within our current. And, um, somehow, never it ceases to amaze me. Somehow we very much after testimony, particularly from the Defender General, seriously cut back the bill to, you know, some issues that I thought were important, the victim notification and you know, the competency hearing, and somehow we we're spending more money than we did when we had the 90-page bill. How did this happen? <laughs> You're spelling this on paper. <laughs> <laughs> it's got inverse proportion. Never ceases to amaze me here. Um, 
I didn't. I, I just kind of assumed that we were doing less. So I'll start it because Chittenden County, damn that Chittenden County. You know, if that was part of New York, we wouldn't be having this problem. Or can it is part of New York compared to, uh, so say, some people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've heard that the best thing about Chittenden County is that it's pretty close to Vermont. I, I just don't know. Um, um, can we just add in job engine for the state? <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> revenue driver of the entire Vermont enterprise. Spoken uh -huh. by the oh. senator. Oh. Oh. I, I just don't know, you know how this happens. <laughs> but, OK. The, the answer is always have really long bills, because Will it's this, inverse. Right. Will this leave us with a better system? Most assuredly, in my opinion. I guess it remains to be seen. I didn't think the current one was particularly broken, but you know, others disagree. Well, I think the governor disagrees. I know. Well, but sometimes we don't agree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. It's nice to be an independent. <laughs> State's attorneys, any comment? Um, is no, not. Well, would you rather, rather wait till tomorrow? Are you taking out tomorrow? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think I'd like to wait till tomorrow. I, I, wait, I'm taking it up tomorrow. Well, we, have, we don't have it on schedule. We do have free from 10 to 11. Well, yeah. We have it on schedule for Tuesday at 10 30. Well, I don't want to. We have markup in vote Tuesday at 10 30. We're never going to get to mark up. We need to take more testimony. We should take more testimony tomorrow if we expect to get there on Tuesday. I don't know the timing. I doubt you have to take a phone call tomorrow. No, no, no. I meant the testimony tomorrow. What's that? Oh, the fiscal note. Yeah. Oh, maybe we should wait till Tuesday. What do we do tomorrow from 10 30 to 11 30? Oh, okay. Maybe we could review what they did with S54. So I think they're voting it out today. No, really? I don't know. Okay. You're trying to make that your deadline? Are you available tomorrow at 10.30? Yep. What would you like to take? <laughs> I don't know. Thanks, Pity. I have yeah. to turn it I'll, I'll, I'll see what else we have. Well, there might be something you'd like to take. Yeah. You know, that you've just been waiting. We could review the miscellaneous bill we were talking about this morning. Yes. Yeah, but we still need much motor vehicle to oh, talk about it. They're the main group. And Jake uh, can't come over tomorrow? Huh? He couldn't come tomorrow? Yeah, so maybe he come. Yes, please do. But, um, and then maybe Jack, you as well, or whoever else would chime in on this. So going back to section one, I mean, Darren, I'm hearing you, you were mentioning the fact that, you know, removing the DMH's party status using that terminology and adopting the language that Jack suggested mm -hmm. for later on in the proceedings covers that issue. But at the earlier stage, I think what you were getting at was the section one removal of that language. So would it, instead of saying be a party, just say shall receive notice? Like would that kind of cover what, yes. what you're getting at in that way? All right. Great. Thank you. Did you do, did you do the uh, expungement tool? No, yeah, it's, no, it's brain. Brain. Did you do the oh. on the yeah. on the notice? Yes. So once there was a finding by the court of incompetency, the next step would be hospitalization hearing. That's what, that's when they're talking. That's where Jack's right. amendment would come in. That's when they they that, get they would represent as as you pointed out, right? And we at that point the court would include notice uh, to the DMH. Right. I think they're asking for earlier in the, in the proceedings, though, unless I'm missing something. Yeah, just, just to have the notice earlier, not, right. not representation. 
uh, notice okay. after or finding of its confidence. I think we're actually thinking that just notice that the confidence is at issue. As, 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 as issue. I'm going to get a right to fund you. Uh, who, who you don't have to wait to do it. That that's why I was thinking that once we've made that determination, that's when it would make sense to immediately tell you yeah. so that you could be ready for the hospitalization <coughs> hearing. That's what I had in mind. But that would be covered by Jack's language, right? Right. 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 Yeah, so. But that, that's the stage you're talking about, and then we're going to be obviously notified since uh, they're being provided with the opportunity to. So be represented on, through the AG. On right. the face of it, I think I, I, I agree. I just want to check with my commissioner to make sure uh, we're on the same page. OK. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, she's not as Brinnaville. If you're available, you can call me. Yeah. You'd be getting the bills from one. I don't always every other day. Yeah. I don't want to do my work. I know, that's what I was just going to say. Yeah, we can do it all over. Right. Yeah. Good for you. Um, <clears throat> all right, well, I don't know that I want to waste anybody's time. Anybody else comment on Sandy? You know, if I, I do not mind at all. I'll take another page out for you. Michelle is on Fraser. Yeah. Run free. Um, Matt Valerio, Defender General, back on insanity. I raised uh, an issue um, yesterday on page, uh, I believe it's 7 of 10, involving the, an addition to the non-testimonial order statute or uh, rule 16.1, uh, which would um, allow a mental examination by a psychiatrist or other expert. Um, yeah. Yeah. In, by the state, and I had indicated at that time that I believed that it was, first of all, inappropriate for a non-testimonial order um, to be in that, to be dealt with uh, under those terms. Um, and I, my initial review of it personally was that it implicated Fifth and Sixth Amendment rights of the defendant not to uh, testify effectively to give any, uh, uh, you know, verbal testimony regarding his uh, situation, and that the that, that uh, sanity issue is a defense um, that is uh, um, subject to the decision of the defendant if they've been found competent. Um, I did, I told you I was having this reviewed by um, the appellate division um, to see if, you know, my analysis was accurate. In fact, my analysis, according to my appellate division, was accurate that a, that a uh, uh, mental examination um, is testimonial in nature, not non-testimonial. You understand the difference? So when you're getting a non-testimonial order, you're talking about uh, the taking of fingernail clippings, or hair, or DNA, or blood, or saliva, or whatever it is, to usually to uh, establish the identity of somebody. Right? Uh, it is scientific in nature in that it's you know chemical, or mm -hmm. physical, or, or the like, and you need to have a warrant before you can you know, see his fingernail clippings or, or, or blood or whatever it is that you want to take. Uh, a mental examination uh, is testimonial in nature in that it requires the defendant to speak um, and to describe what might have been going on or not going on and the like. And our Constitution says that you have a right to remain silent, uh, that you don't have an obligation to uh, to speak uh, to the prosecutor and quote unquote tell your side of the story of what was going on in your head at the time. Um, and that uh, as a result, uh, not putting this in to, to kind of term it, first of all, it shouldn't be in a non-testimonial order section. Second of all, the reason it probably never was in 
in, unlike in civil cases where you can get evaluations of people depending upon the issues you raise, is that constitutionally you're barred from having the defendant te quote unquote testify, give speak words contrary to their interests, or maybe in, in favor of their interests. They don't have an obligation to do anything. They can just sit there um, throughout the trial and, uh, and argue uh, sanity defenses based on facts and circumstances. So uh, in any event, it was pretty clear that uh, uh, to them that this doesn't hold constitutional muster uh, because it is testimonial in nature as opposed to not. And under the current statutory framework, what is going on is effectively a review by the state expert of the information that is available, um, kind of like a record review um, or a, um, whether it's medical records, mental health records, um, or factual review of what went on in the case, or usually all of that stuff that gives rise to an opinion um, as to whether or not, the, if there's a defense as an expert, whether that, that defense expert, um, whether their opinion holds water, um, or not, um, and uh, uh, you know, so going forward, uh, you know, that is going to be an, an issue for us if it remains in the bill. Um, and I told you why, and you know, sometimes you don't agree with me, but uh, well, uh, I know that it is a thing that the state's attorneys <coughs> would love to do is to, you know, kind of have any ability to talk to your client. Uh, while the case is pending, uh, which is something that but, they cannot do now. But under current law, on line 17, on page 6, submit to a reasonable physical or medical medical inspection of his body or if notice is given by the defendant that sanity is an issue or that accept or that expert testimony may be offered as provided by Rule 12.1 to a reasonable mental health examination by a psychiatrist or other expert. And what we've added is that submit to a reasonable medical examination by a psychiatrist or other expert on a court examiner pursuant to the 13 but reports that the defender is not competent to stand trial. What, is that what you're complaining? That's what I'm complaining about, Jay. Well, but current law provides that. Um, not in, well, the case state the sheriff that indicates that you can't compel a, a uh, individual to uh, have an, an examination of the kind that you um, are talking about in J. Um, and I, what I think is that the, what I think is in, the statute is based on it, it's constitutionally based. Um, so yeah, you, I, what, what, you just said, well, it's statutory, you relied on the statute, because that's the easy way to do it. But the statute is constitutionally based, based on Fifth and Sixth Amendment grounds. Of course, that's going to be the argument when it gets to the Supreme Court, if you put this in there. But I'd be remiss if I didn't let you know that we find it problematic. No, I, I appreciate that, but I'm just saying that currently, the court can order that, then it's under kind of law. So I, this just adds an end. It doesn't happen that way. <laughs> well, well, we'll um, argue all of this out. Is and Michelle and available? If in fact, tomorrow? that's what's happening. Why do you need it? Is Michelle available? Tomorrow? No, I think the question is what's no, the distinction please. between allowing the court? Right to order the, psych, the mental examination when the insanity of defense is raised, as opposed to when take competency. Up those. Because competency is jurisdictional and sanity is a defense. Both, both the state That's and the defense have, in theory, the same interest on a competency evaluation as they going yeah. forward, because yeah. neither one of them See if Matt would want to have, and I think this is important, but it's technical legal garbage. Um, Issue. Nobody wants to, well, nobody wants to have a, an incompetent person be subject to the jurisdiction of the court. And a prosecutor, it would be unethical for a prosecutor to try to prosecute somebody who they knew 
was incompetent, and it would be unethical for an attorney representing that person to allow the person to be subject to the jurisdiction of the court if that person was incompetent. Once you get by the issue of competency, now you're in the issue of defense. Okay, so now you're subject to the jurisdiction of the court. The next step is defense. And as part of defense, the, the client doesn't have an obligation to provide testimony on their own behalf in support of a defense. That's the, it's a different constitutional issue. So one is jurisdictional, am I subject to the power of the court? And the second in what is, what do I have to do when I raise the defense of insanity? Um, you can raise the defense of insanity, never hire an expert, put the, all the evidence that you have in except for the client testifying and say, look, jury, can't you see this guy was insane at the time? And the jury has the right to make a decision, yes or no. Now, as I had surveyed before with my people that nobody ever wins an insanity defense with a jury, but in theory, that's, you can do that. You don't need an expert, right? But if you have an expert, the state has the right to cross-examine that expert on the basis for their opinion. So if they had interviews and they had, and, and doctors do this all the time, um, reviewing other doctors' records to make determinations as to whether or not they're applying the appropriate statutory scheme, whether or not they're looking at the, uh, whether or not they're qualified to make the evaluation, and whether or not they're up on the, um, the standards in the medical and psychiatric profession and the like, and they can test that person's opinion. But they don't have the right to talk to your client. That's the testimonial part. What? And that's what the problem is. And when I argue it before the Supreme Court, if you, <laughs> decide, if you decide to blatantly you know, uh, flaunt the Constitution by passing the bill, um, but when I get a chance to argue it, I'll say the same thing. Uh, <laughs> I will be there. <laughs> And then I'll come so back and I say, take a so. And uh, <laughs> which I do somewhat regularly. <laughs> As 205 is going into the expungement bill. Okay, so can I ask yeah. a question? Yes. yes. So, not in an order of hospitalization or that not hospitalization, simple, I can walk through that. That's civil. And so that. Um, it's the five years. Okay, charge. that's it. So, that's once competency is found or not found. Right, right. Or if somebody's going to deep But, but into this one is. Bill. This is part of the criminal case. Okay, got it. Thank you, though. So you, you yeah. can't compel somebody to testify in their criminal case, and this okay. is testimony. Okay, I get it. Okay. Um, speaking for the prosecution, this is like being on a jury. <laughs> Uh, James Pepper, Department of State Attorneys and Sheriffs. Well, you can come up and... I would never want to be on a jury. <laughs> well, this is, this is what it's like. Uh, um, so it, our appellate division drafted this provision, and our appellate division, in fact, it was the attorney that argued the Sherrill case, and he does not feel that there is a Fifth or Sixth Amendment issue here. Um, anything that comes out during the competency evaluation other than the recommendation of competency or incompetency cannot be used against the defendant um, in the criminal case. So um, I just, I don't see an issue here. The Shero case was decided on a statutory interpretation. Um, if we want to change the statute as opposed to the criminal rule to move it out of the non-testimonial order section, I can understand that. That was something that we discussed. Um, I don't, I, Either what we, the reason why we chose to do it here as opposed to in, in the statute is that um, we didn't want to tinker around with anything else that might have an implication on sanity. Um, so, um, but I'm sure that this will go to the Supreme Court and the same attorney that argued Cheryl will probably argue this. <laughs> Something to look forward to. Um, <laughs> If we leave it in. If you leave it in, that's right. Other? And if we take it out, what is the impact? The impact would be the status quo um, that the um, state would not be able to retain an expert to evaluate a person who's claiming to be incompetent. Okay. 
So, any other questions on those, or either that or um, you, Could you check with a Supreme Court judge and see <laughs> I will. I, Thank I, you. I wouldn't comment beyond that since I sometimes <laughs> fill in on the Supreme Court, so I'm not going to offer any of these. But if you were to, that would <laughs> be they won't do that. I know they won't. Just, that was a rhetorical I, question. I wish sometimes they, they would do it. Huh? They used to give an opinion. The Supreme sometimes Court. Sometimes they give opinions with direction. They used uh, to for example, here. Yeah, uh, they, did. they used to never even show up here. They used to even show up here. They didn't even show up. They didn't even show up. They used to, they have given opinions yeah. in opinions. That, that the legislature should change right. this, that sort of thing. But not ahead of But they would not give us an opinion ahead of time whether they would find oh, this no, to be constitutional no, 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 or not. Right. That's, that's why I was no, joking with Judge right. Pearson. Okay. That's why I'm leaving. I naively that's why the judge asked to come to the committee yeah. once and ask and right. I'll let you talk testify about whether it would be constitutional. Any, any other or comments on this bill today? We will pick up here on Tuesday or Wednesday. Stay tuned. Pepper, are you available tomorrow around 10.30? Yes. I was going to take up the expungement bill. Yes. Bryn's available to walk us through it. And um, that, since you're the clerk of the Sentencing Commission, and since it is the Sentencing Commission report, perhaps you yeah. walk us through that as well. So that would get us ready for our meeting on the 27th in Minuski, so we've already walked through the bill. My afternoon thing got screwed over because it's winter break. For